Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 150 for Monday, January 22nd, 2018. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians. As always, or at least as mostly, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. How goes it, Mr. Kent? Goes good, man. Here we are, midwinter. You know, we're just kind of like living the dream, and whatever gigs come by, we're grateful for and planning for another busy summer. I played twice last week at a really good Friday night trio gig. We have really turned, Acoustic Madness has really turned this one venue that we play on Friday nights into a music room. I mean, oh, nice. we play there. Yeah, we play there. It's a restaurant. It's a nice restaurant with a sure. nice bar. We play there once a month. We've been doing it for about two years, three years now. And um, people, like, we don't really promote those gigs. I mean, there's like a, a one concentric circle of fans that, you know, check our Facebook invites. and But basically, people check the, the, um, the venue's website you sure. know, the restaurant's website because they now promote it and i think they might put a poster up in the window or something like that but we have a full house and great tips i mean the tips now are out we're getting more in tips than we are in, in pay which so it's a really good pay night it's always great and yeah it's, yeah and again it's fun like i said i don't like um restaurant gigs in general because i don't like playing over the din of clinking silverware and that type of stuff but we start at 7 30 Mm. go to 10 30 so it's kind of past the dinner hour you know some people are still ordering a late dinner or dessert or something like that but you know but by they know and large, what they're in for the, yeah right yeah and there yeah. we have regulars like real regulars many many regulars so that's you know the, the, everything about that is cool to me that we changed the vibe of a room got people to pay attention to us you know we're not background music um that we have regulars which is like that's about as That's much flattery cool. as you can have at any level. You know, if you're if you're a superstar and you got ten thousand regulars coming to see you in a certain town, good for that. But even at our little scale, just to have people go out of their way, plan around coming to see us is really kind of fun. That's and, yeah, uh, that's it. When people start planning their lives around your schedule, that that is you know a very flattering. It's great. It's it's humbling. It's great. It's yes, validating. It's all of those things. Yeah. They're appreciative of the music. And I, actually, one of the things about Acoustic Madness that is interesting. So Steve, you know, my music partner, I play with Steve and Mary Ellen. Steve yeah. is to say a human jukebox would be to undersell his talent. So remember, he he went on um, can't remember the lyrics or whatever the game show was and won. I mean, he's got an encyclopedic knowledge of music. I mean, he he retains an amazing amount. He pretty much knows every Beatles song. So any Beatles request we have. So we get into a little bit bouts of request, request, request Orama there. And mostly, you know, one out of 10 songs will be one that's in my library, but seven out of 10 songs will be in his library. And then maybe one or two will be on his iPad. But, um, but we, one of the ways we get a lot of tips is that we could we play just about it's anything. Totally so way. I follow yeah. along and yeah. Yep. And it, but it's turned out to be a very fun gig. I mean, acoustic Madness has got, we have one gig that we almost gave up because uh, the configuration, of the restaurant, people couldn't actually get to us to tip and they had to walk over a lot of other tables and sure. it was kind of awkward. And, and, uh, and uh, it really, it's a new venue. It's a, it's a wine bar. And people go to this wine bar in couples or, or groups to talk to each other. The music, it's very hard to get them to pay attention to us. I mean, it's a brand new place that doesn't have a vibe you know, and the vibe that it, it seems to be getting off the top of its head. We play a six to nine as people coming in for like a date night or something like that. Uh, it's not about the music there. And again, it is not configured that much for the music. Sure. So we actually went to the to the owners and we said, hey, you know, I don't know if this is working out. I don't think it's working out for you um, because it doesn't seem like music's adding anything. And here's our concern. He goes, no, no, we want to stick with this. We love you guys. He gave us a good raise that basically covered the difference in what we would have been getting in tips. And so he, you know, yeah. So that was kind of a flattering thing and a cool thing. But, you know, not all venues work out. I mean, it's funny to me. I see when that happens, like, you know, kudos to you for recognizing that this is going in a direction that's that's non-optimal for you. But but almost at the same time, likely not optimal for the, for the venue itself. 
And clearly they want to make a change. And, and so they're, they're willing to invest a little to make that happen. And that's good. But it, you know, it, so many times you can just sort of sit, it's too easy to sit back and say, Oh yeah. Don't like, don't upset the apple cart. Don't, don't acknowledge the elephant that's not in the yeah. room in terms of the yeah. crowd, you know, and just like keep the gigs coming, man. It's good. But that's not, it's like, it, it's okay to prioritize fun along with everything else that, um, that, that goes along with playing a gig. Yeah. Well, and there's a whole wide range of points. There's, so, you know, one is as you and I have said many times when you're first starting out and you need the gig, you know, if it pays a flat fee, it gives you performance experience, you take the gig, right? But when you get to a place where you can actually say is one gig or one opportunity better. So would I rather have a Thursday night open yeah. because something better will come along? You, you get a little bit more you can become uh, selective. leeway. Yeah, you can. Yeah, that's exactly it. And so this one is kind of cool. And the show of goodwill that the owner showed us. Yeah, that's huge. We talked about it. And now we want to do more to help him. So, you yeah. know, that now that he's investing in us, we're like, how can we how can we promote more of this? You know, we made some suggestions as to the seating arrangement that they actually took. And I actually felt very uncomfortable saying, well, let's tell them how to run their business. But we were like, you know, if you no, move, they don't move know this- how to run that aspect of their business. That's often true. Time, right. Because I, I, we actually went in and I'll we'll talk about more about this gig on th- that I had this weekend uh, a little bit later. But uh, that was one of the things that came up was we were playing in this room and and we were we were not quite fully set up. Um, we were maybe halfway there. It would have been easy to move things around. And I said, you know, like, it'd be better if you had the band over there as opposed to here. And there were already like things that already happened, but it, there was a, there was a discussion. And it, what I realized was, yeah, it's your place. You, uh, you know, you you run this place, but you don't see 50 other rooms every year. You don't experience a full night of the logistics of 50 other rooms all year. Like we actually are the experts on this here, <laughs> you know, and, and our, you know, our suggestions probably should carry some weight because we know more about this than you do. If you're not used to doing music here, it, you know, um, and, and that was actually well received. I mean, I didn't say it that way. I just sort of realized it was right. being received that way. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's tact involved, but it was like, you tact know, is important. Yeah. Like, Hey, it might be, and they be were, careful about telling somebody there, you, know, you, you don't yes. know what they think they know. No, no. It, it's, I, I posed it more as a question. Like, you know, what do you think? Is it good here? Cause there's this aisle way that people are going to want to use. If we kind of tucked over there into that corner, we'd get exposure to more of the room. They're like, Oh, that's actually a really good idea. And then there was the, all right, like how far along have things moved? Should we be changing it now? We'd have to move this table of people three feet. Like, that's okay. They just sat down. But it was like, all right, next time. Okay, cool. Like, great. No problem. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. So, so tell me about your gigs. Yeah. So I had a gig on Saturday afternoon. It was a, a one to four gig, which I, I find that I really like that time slot um, because it, it sort of takes over your whole day, but uh, or your whole, you know, daytime part of the day, but it leaves your evening free. You don't really have time in the morning to get like, you know, involved in other stuff. So I liked that time frame. It was a, it was an opera ski party fundraiser and giveaways and all this stuff at sort of the, the, what I would call the closest ski mountain to us here at Gunstock, which is about an hour from my house. And, uh, and it, it was, it was fun. We did it as an acoustic trio. And so we played monkey fist, but uh, our normal guitar player, Jimmy couldn't make this gig. So we brought in uh, this guy that plays with us quite a bit. This guy, Matt Langley, who also is a human jukebox. In fact, I called him that several times on stage on, uh, on Saturday. And, and you know, it's, it becomes that whole request fest thing where people try to stump the band. And, uh, and the worst part was at the end of the gig, we're packing up and somebody came up and they're like, Oh, uh, and he had given us quite a bit of money. He's like, I had the $50 challenge for you guys. And it was like, Oh, it's, it's too late. I said, well, all right, tell me what was it going to be? He said, I was going to give you 50 bucks to play anything by rush. And the funny part was Matt, And I, with this bass player, Steve, who also happened to be there and came up and sang a tune with us, uh, have played Rush tunes before. So it would have been it wouldn't have been a problem. So we could have really, you know, like sealed in the crowd (laughs) with that. But, you know, whatever. Um, So so it was a it was a fun gig. People were 
you know, it, people were some people were there just to, you know, have lunch and see the band. Other people had, you know, either were there just to have lunch and then go back out on the slopes and ski or some just like were finished with their skiing for the day and decided to, you know, do their skiing um, with back and forth to the bar to get their beverages. But um, but it was a fun, fun thing. But a couple of things came up. So the the first was the sound. Um, this is like it, it, it to anybody who's never been in a ski lodge before. This looks like what you think a ski lodge looks like. Right. It's a wood walls. Um, it was a three story building. We were up like on one side of the top floor, sort of enclosed, sort of not uh, where they have this bar that's otherwise just part of this big other open lodge and uh, all wood, wood floor, wood ceiling, wood walls. And we had an interesting thing. When we tuned the PA, we did our own sound. When we tuned the PA, I, um, you know, I, it, we were, we all just happened to be standing in front of where our mics were. So I didn't move from mic to mic to hear anything. I just had everybody kind of say stuff. All right. You know, great. Tune the EQ found that there was a lot of high end, um, you know, feedback that was going to happen. So we had to pull that out because, you know, with wood everywhere, that makes sense. So, okay, great. Got it going. Then I walked out into the room and just had John, we had some announcements to do. So I was like, perfect. I'm going to turn on the mains. I'll tune the mains while you're doing the announcements and we'll make it happen. And the whole time he's doing that, I'm hearing like some more high end feedback. I'm like, I guess that's coming out of the mains. So I tuned it out. Like, I guess it's going to be okay. So we get the gig going and it's fine. And then um, about halfway through the first set, I guess, um, Matt's going to sing a song. So John takes off and he goes out in the room and he's out for maybe 20 seconds. He comes back. He's like, you should bring the guitar and the cajon up a little bit in the mains. I'm like, great, no problem. And then maybe 30 seconds after that, this high end feedback squeal starts slowly creeping in. And so I'm like, okay, great. Pull the guitar and the cajon out because that's what we just changed. Doesn't change anything. Crap. You know, okay, it's getting worse and worse. All right, got to mute the mains. Doesn't solve it. That's weird. Mute the monitors. Okay, now it's gone. I was like, well, what did we, what did we change? Like, we didn't change anything with the monitors. All we did was change the main mix. And that's when I realized we changed one thing. John stood, uh, stepped away from his mic. And his mic, or he, was between his microphone and the wall behind him, which was all wood. And that's what was happening. It just built up this feedback loop. I was like, oh, yeah, I got to remember when you're in a club like that, like that, that would or really if you're close to a wall in any way or a reflective surface in any way, you got to really think about that. Um, when you're, when you're doing sound and sure enough, it, it, once we knew about it, we knew what to do, but if anybody was going to step away, we would just, you know, hit, hit the mute on their mic, uh, real quick, just to make sure that it didn't build up. But it was a really interesting kind of thing because, um, you know, it's, <laughs> it's always frustrating when it just sort of happens and you're like, wait, I already tuned this out. So that was, that was the first lesson from that gig, which was interesting. Um, the uh, the the other interesting part was, <laughs> have you ever been at a gig when you're playing and then someone's due to play after you or you're due to play after somebody and the schedule is confused? We played one to four, but this was sort of a special party. Uh, evidently, this place has music uh, sometimes on Saturdays and the other guy was booked to start at three. So he showed up. <laughs> Thankfully, he was a, he, a good guy, somebody that, uh, you know, kind of a staple of the community, this guy, Paul Warnick. And uh, and so he actually played a couple of tunes with us, which was really fun and uh, and all of that. But it was. So who was the uh, who was the chief decider of, of how to mitigate that problem? I, honestly, I didn't even know the problem existed until we finished. Um, as we were packing up, I said to Paul. Like, hey, man, like what what time are you due to start? Like, you know, how quickly do we need to get our stuff off the stage so, so that you can set up? He's like three. And at this point, it's, you know, 410 or something. I was like, oh, OK, no problem. <laughs> so I think he walked. I don't know actually what the evolution of that was. My guess is he walked in and said, I'm here to start at three. And they're like, oh, actually, this other party goes till four. They use a booking agent, I'm pretty sure for. In fact, I think they use Paul Costley, uh, who we had on the show here for the the bookings 
generally there. So they probably just, you know, tell him, OK, go go fill up all our Saturdays for the year or whatever it is, you know, for the ski season. And then right. um, and, you know, and then uh, nobody really thought to to coordinate the two because it was, you know, two different sets of brains thinking about two separate things just happened to be in the same space. But um, got it. Yeah, but he was, he, you know, he was the consummate professional. The fact that I didn't know was is testament enough, right, to the fact that he just, okay, like, there's some momentum here. We're not going to mess with it. Like, it's all good. <laughs> so we don't, we, I haven't run into that. We've actually been pretty fortunate. I don't know that we've ever been double booked. The band, mm -hmm. the, the acoustic stuff has, but sure. but I don't know that the band has ever been double booked. And I think that's because I usually, like, touch base the week of, of a gig or, sure. you know, I kind of, like, you know, follow up, close all loops. Uh, but we do play a lot of these fairs and festivals where there's multiple bands on a bill. And it's interesting how the different, the different organizers handle the time schedule. So the one thing is when we get put on a festival bill, I always tell people, don't expect to get a 10 piece band on stage, mic and sound checked in 20 minutes. It's just right. not going to happen. Right. And sometimes they insist on doing it anyway. And, you know, I, I remind them, but mostly we won't play until we're set. That's, that's one level of confidence that we have that, um, we won't go on until everybody's comfortable and, and the sound check is right. Sure. And sometimes it gets, you know, I would say 40 to 45 minutes is about the minimum for getting the other band off, getting us on, and we're ready, you know, we're to get on there, uh, getting everything mics. It's just, it's a lot of mics to run. Yeah. There's, you know, four, um, four or five monitor mixes to get set. And we, I try to prep people, but if we take the gig, you know, we will say, Hey, we got to get this right. Or it's not going to sound right. We don't want to sound bad. You know, we'll, we will, we will hold our ground and say, you know, sure. we're not going to go before we're ready. But you probably um, also would decline a gig if the organizers, and I realize in most cases they don't even have the wherewithal to tell you this, but I've, I've been involved in some gigs where it's clear they know exactly what they're doing and they tell you, OK, look, there's 20 minutes to switch over. There is one monitor mix on stage. Here's how we're going to do this. You know, based on the size of the room, we know we need to only mic like, you know, vocals and kick yes. drum or, you know, I mean, whatever. Like if, if they understand their logistics and are are realistic about it in order to keep their pacing. Like if they tell you it's only going to be 20 minutes to, to change this over, et cetera, et cetera, you, you would, it, I mean, if it sounds like it's a bad thing for you, you would just decline that as opposed That's to. That's true. Yeah. Well, well, there's actually, there's a few things. So as I've said many times, we are very fortunate to have a bill. So right. Bill, <laughs> Bill does advance for every gig. Mm -hmm. So sometimes before I sign a, a deal, I'll ask Bill to touch base with him on, on what the tech specs are. And Bill, you know, will, he's very resourceful. He'll always come up with a plan. Yes, there's only two monitor mixes has happened before. Sure. And so we'll figure out what it is and we'll figure out. And also, often uh, Bill will say, do you want me to bring our gear and and, you know, I can take care of the technical parts of stuff. And some people are really happy to let him do it. And so then, you know, the technical stuff goes away. But the point of all this is actually more about time. And so. We occasionally will take a gig if it's if we're not the top bill of something, you know, if sure. you know, we're the second to top or something like that. We really won't take two. I don't can't remember the last time we took a gig that was like before two in the afternoon. But but uh, but sometimes we'll take that two to four slot if the headline is four to six or something like that. Um, and so the headline slot, we just when we're ready, we go. But it's interesting what happens when we're not the headline slot. And we're you know having a good gig. We will occasionally have a booker say, you know, you started 15 minute, minutes late, go ahead in 15 minutes. I'll deal with the headliner and, you know, sure. give them 15, whatever they do. But, you know, like a really astute um, stage manager um, will make some interesting calls from time to time that are what are going to make his audience most happy. So if we're killing and he wants us to keep going, you know, we'll keep going. Huh. So we'll still like, even if we're contracted from two to four, if I don't start playing at two 30 because of sound checked issues, I'll still give two hours of music. Um, you know, as long as nobody in my band has let me know in advance that they had to be out for something else. But, you know, we, we will deliver the amount of music that we have, but I kind of quite honestly, Dave, I, I'll, I'll take it as a guideline. If I know that they're not listening intently yes. enough when i say to them understand it, a 20 a 20 minute turnover is not realistic um and then i'll just stand my ground and, and i'll be like dude it has to be right we don't want to sound poorly you yeah. know, you'll see the guy getting nervous you know when you have a long turnover you lose the audience a little bit and those totally. types of things yeah <clears throat> but we've we've been 
fairly insistent that everybody get close to what they need in terms of a you know a monitor mix and make sure mics are on and nothing's ringing and that type of thing. Yeah, uh, we're we're fairly insistent. I mean, you know, no, a lot you have of to be at at some. I mean, you need to know what the bare minimum is for your band to be successful on stage. And that that's going to be different for every band, right? I mean, for you guys, you know, with a with a ten piece band, and you've got horns, and you know, I mean, you have more needs than your average, you know, four piece rock band. Um, and maybe, I mean, I don't know, maybe some four piece rock bands have, you know, <laughs> insane needs. I don't know, but you, you need to know what that baseline is. Someone in your band really needs to be the one that leads that charge of saying no. It's not good enough yet. Like we, right. we we are going. Yes, we could start right now. But 10 minutes from now, everyone is going to regret jumping this decision. And uh, and and I, you know, oftentimes that becomes me at gigs. And I've learned actually and it that, like I can do it to myself. Even, you know, you have a, an, a, a 9 p.m. start or whatever it is at a club. Hey, you know, if you start at nine ten in most clubs, and you should know this before you, you know, before you start making these these executive decisions. But if you if it takes you an extra ten minutes, most clubs aren't going to care, right? Some clubs do, and you should know that. But uh, I I find that if I if I have a beer before I've gotten the sound right, I will make the wrong decision. <laughs> uh, you know, but, well, because I'll I'll say, you know what, it's good enough. Let's go. And, and I've just, I, you know, I can look back and say, oh, that's really interesting. Like there's that little bit of the edge that the alcohol takes off and, and I, I will, I will not take it all the way to the, to the end where it should be and get the God forbid, right. God forbid it's a tequila or, or a vodka drink. Yeah. You know, I don't like hard liquor. At, I don't drink a lot of hard liquor anyway, but, um, hard liquor at gigs. I can't sing if I've had mm. hard liquor, um, or e even a lot of liquor, but, um, but yeah, but, it, you know, just usually a beer. Somebody will always say, oh, you know, you want to get beers or whatever. And my answer is always no. Let me get the sound right first. And no matter how long that takes, even if it takes right up till two minutes before downbeat. OK, fine. You know, no problem. I, like, let's just go. I'd rather get have the right. sound right. Yeah, you got to get it right. It, it, I, I don't know. I, I just it's and what what I really don't like. And, and this, you know, is exactly what happened Saturday is going on stage knowing I didn't know what the problem was going to be, but I knew we were going to have a problem. Like just the way this room was, it was built like a wooden speaker. It's like, like I knew like this is, mm. there's no way we're going to make it through this gig without there being some level of distraction for me with the sound. It's not going to be automatic. And sure enough, you know, that's what happened. <laughs> mm. But I don't know. Stand but, your ground. That's, that's the lesson. You do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, there was a couple other things that happened. One of them that really surprised me. Um, was, you know, obviously Tom Petty passed a long time ago, uh, not that long ago, but months ago, many, many days ago. And, uh, but it was this week that we found out that it was opiates that they mm -hmm. killed him. It was an opiate overdose. And that really bummed me out for a lot of reasons, but, um, it's like, ah, oh, that sucks. You know, like it's one thing if somebody's body just can't hang on anymore and like it was his time, but an opiate overdose is generally not that, you know, um, that's just a one-time thing. And we lost Prince that way. And, um, and I found myself, uh, completely unexpectedly. We played th well, three Tom Petty songs, two, uh, that were Petty songs, the American girl and, uh, and free fallen. And then somebody requested, uh, traveling Wilburys, and, and this was a, a, a moment where it was great to watch Matt. He's like, oh, I don't know if I've ever played that before. And he like starts playing the guitar <laughs> riff. You know, it just comes out of his hands. Like, I don't know if he's heard a song like halfway through once he knows it. Lyrics, chords. Which song was it? Uh, we played, um, uh, uh, the what's the, the... Handle with Care? Yeah, that's it. Handle with Care. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> but you cool and I song. had played before. Yeah. Yeah. Cool yeah. song. Yeah. It's a fun song. And it was great with the three of us because we by the by the time we got to the end, we had split things up the right way and we were really having fun with it. it was, and the crowd liked it because they could see the evolution of us sort of mm. learning. And I, we all had heard the song. Some of us, at least me, had played it 100 years ago. But, it, you know, they could see us sort of working it out in the moment, which is fun. But um, but there was that one and then the other two. And I found myself mid song in tears. Um all three times just thinking about, you know, how sad it is that, that, um, 
had a, of all things, an opiate overdose had to had to take him from us. So you know that um, he played a large part of this last tour, fifty three dates with a broken hip. It was actually a fractured I, a fra- fractured yeah. hip that became a broken hip. Is what they said. The family shared um, when last they week announced yeah. this information, yeah. and you know the pain was incredible. And so you know, I I, I imagine that that's what the connection is. Is that you know, totally. The pain, that, Pain became so unbearable that you're just looking for any way out of the pain. And that's that's pretty horrible. It is. There are other ways to deal with pain, though, even other pharmaceutical ways to deal with pain that don't involve opiates. And I I like I could get very political about this because opiates really bother me. But um, but, you know, it's not going to change what happened. So. Yeah. 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 So that was that was sort of a, an interesting thing, because when he passed initially, it didn't. Uh, I mean, it was like, wow, that sucks, but it, uh, it didn't hit me that hard. And then suddenly I found myself kind of, you know, I didn't even realize it at first. It's like, am I really sweating? No, like, "Hmm, okay. (laughs) What is this feeling? (laughs) It was a pretty sweaty gig. Well, I mean, and for me playing music, I mean, emotions and it's all mixed into one. I, you know, I, I can't separate things out in the moment like that. And that's actually one of the, I, I'll say playing music with you. That's really an interesting thing because you and I know each other pretty well now and we've known each other for quite a while. I really enjoy the transformation of you behind a drum kit. So different than every other aspect of how I know you. You definitely have a you have a zone that is very pervasive from downbeat till the end. You know, even on breaks. I mean, you're you're locked into a, a very different guy, maybe more than anyone else I know, you know, like. Like I said, I know you real well. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting to me, you know, not Jekyll and Hyde. Like, it's not that there's good and bad. You are just a very, very different cat sitting behind your drums at a gig. You're very focused on every nuance that's happening on stage. You hear everything. You're very focused on taking in a lot of data. (laughs) You're still that guy. You're taking in a lot of data from the audience, right? But, but, you know... uh, you have a big smile on your face, but you have a focus that is a really interesting, um, different from the focus you show, you know, in our business life or in our friendship life. Yeah. But, it, you know, what's really interesting, I, I, I guess I should say thank you for noticing that uh, or th- at least thank you for saying that. Um, although I, I realize it, it isn't necessarily a compliment or anything else. It's just an observation. Um, the next thing I had on my list was in this gig. It was um, Monkey Fist is fronted effectively by by John Donahue, our our singer who also plays guitar some of the time, and then Maddie uh, does his own solo gig, so he's very comfortable just working a crowd. And oftentimes, I'm very involved in the you know that three way conversation that sort of happens or four way conversation between each of the band members and the crowd. But for whatever reason, at least for the first half of the show, I was not speaking to the crowd at all. In fact, I, as, as this next thing I'm about to talk about happened, I realized I hadn't spoken at all to the crowd, but there was a moment where something came up and I, I, you know, I went to say something that was hopefully relevant, seemed relevant to me. And I couldn't put words together. It was, and I realized I was like, Oh crap. I got to switch from like drumming, singing brain (laughs) to talking with humans brain, you know, like it's a very different thing. And it was a very, it doesn't happen often to me where I get totally stumbled up on words, but especially as you know, people that listen to this show might find this (laughs) hard to believe, but but I really, I mean, I knew what I wanted to say and I just, I, I mean, I got there, but it took a minute to you know, wrangle my brain into the right focus to like, Oh yeah, I got to talk with you now. Okay. No problem. I, I got this, you know, <laughs> but it was really interesting. So yeah, it does that, that, that switch from, you know, stage slash playing mindset to communicating verbally mindset um, is, was palpable. <laughs> and you know, there's something, there's something in mind there for, for listeners. So you notice that a lot of people who play, especially if they're just getting back into it or, you know, they're a little afraid to get that focused. You know, there, there, there's a hesitation because they don't want to come off feeling affected. Right. There's, there's one level of 
you know, your growth as a performer, again, always be performing, right? So you take the stage and, you know, it's your new band and you haven't done it in a while. And, uh, you know, you are, you are uncomfortable on stage because you don't know what to do with yourself. Do I look at the stage? You know, do I look at my hands while I'm playing? You know, and, and if you notice many, many, many amateur bands, semi-professional bands, weekend warrior bands, the performance part is the hardest part. The notes are right. Yep. And the groove might even be right. And then when it's relaxed, everybody's smiling and it's a little bit better. But there's that thing about where you're owning the performance. And and I, it's just interesting to me that that ability, even if it's cover music, even if it's not your music, it's still music, that ability to kind of allow yourself to lapse into the emotion of performing anything um, is a layer of uh, comfort that comes with experience. I think it is, you know, you're, you're used to it on stage, yeah. but I think that's one of the hallmarks of an, of an inexperienced performer is a total discomfort and distrust of allowing yourself to literally disappear and focus into what you're doing, into what the group is doing uh, at the, for the, the expense, the fear of looking affected. Does that yeah. make sense? It, it totally does. Uh, yeah. And and it, what's interesting is I, I told it, like when you when you're getting started or like you said, when you're getting back into it, like getting that comfort back or or there in the first place takes a ton of work because um, you, you sort of have to be intentional about it until it becomes automatic and you're really not comfortable until it becomes automatic, but you sort of have to fake it till you make it right. I think like that's, I, that's not the only way to get there, but that's certainly one way to get there. Just pretend like it's okay. And then suddenly you'll convince yourself it's okay. And then everything's good. Um, well, I, I, let me, let's just extract that yeah. a second. So what I'm saying is um, giving yourself as a performer, the freedom to disappear into that focus. Yeah. So whether that, whether that means closing your eyes and letting the music wash over you, whether it means really intently locking in with, if you're a bass player with a drummer, or if you're a guitar player with another guitar player, listening to your band solos, acknowledging, you know, a, a, a part, a passage of music that's really well played. You know, these are all like permissions that an inexperienced performer should give themselves. Yes as a way to really kind of get connected to the process of performing. I would say this is that, that would be the first. But that's what I'm saying. Fake it till you make it is, you know, you're not going to be comfortable giving yourself that permission the first time you do it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so do it anyway, even though it's uncomfortable and really, what you, I mean, you're, you're in, in essence, you're giving yourself permission to be comfortable being like in a, in a different mindset on stage. I mean, that's really what it comes down to, but you're not going to be comfortable the first time you do it. So do it, just do it anyway. Just be in a different mindset, yeah. you know, let yourself do it for one song. Like, you, you know, if, if, if that's what it takes, like just, you know, do it piecemeal until you realize what works for you and then just feel what you feel. Yeah. Feel what you feel. Yeah. It's not, it doesn't have to be the same for you as it does for me. I mean, it like, in fact, it, it shouldn't it at, at a very specific level, maybe at a meta level. Yeah. It's, you know, it's the same thing, but. But the different. goal is a is a truthful communication of the of the musical experience. So you as the performer are trying to channel a truth, uh, your truth of, of, of making the music. You know, and if your truth is that you're going to be incredibly uncomfortable with performing music, that's a that's a hard truth to to uh, <laughs> yeah, to monetize. You know, it is. Well, that's the thing is, you know, I feel like you it it needs to be true, but it doesn't need to necessarily be the whole truth. Right. Mm. Because musicians, I, I, I've always said this and I wasn't the first one, but, you know, if you go to see a band live, the the shyest person, the most, you know, socially, um, uh, uh, what's the right word? The socially inept person in the room is usually the person on stage. Right. Mm. They, because that's just how it works. Um, not always, but but oftentimes that's how it is. So you don't necessarily need to be up there communicating that, right? <laughs> but, you know, communicating whatever truth you can and and crafting that so that it is true what you're communicating, but it doesn't need to be like if you're anxious going on stage, then you don't need to communicate that to the crowd. It's OK to be anxious. There's nothing wrong with it. But that doesn't come across as comforting to them knowing that you're anxious, right? You know, and because I hit the stage anxious most of the time, 
And it's anxious because I want it to be good. I want to put on a good performance. I want it to be right. Well, you want to channel that, right? It's, it, that anxious yeah. is, is adrenaline. That anxious is, yeah. you know, a little bit of stage fright that just comes from knowing that the unknown is about to happen. And, right. And so, and then, but I, I think that's a natural thing for most people. And then the, when you have a mastery of that and you can channel that, yeah, uh, you know, but that, you, don't need to you don't need to communicate that specific aspect of it, but just, yeah, embrace it for yourself and then communicate what what works. But what's interesting is once for me, especially like that is the most comfortable place I can be mm. like I don't I, I and I've, I've actually been thinking about that a lot lately that there are there are a few places, if any, um where I feel truly comfortable uh, other than being on stage playing in front of people, which is, which is interesting because it's a very uncomfortable place to be. <laughs> yeah. There's a, there's a great line in that, uh, that long Tom Petty um, um, documentary yeah. Run down a dream where they were going through a really difficult phase through, you know, battling with record companies. And uh, Mike Campbell is telling the story that, that Tom reaches, leans over to him in the midst of a gig. The band is, you know, tense with each other. And he says to him, up here, nothing can touch us. Yeah. 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 That's it really be the what sacred it is. Place. Yeah. And, you know, I'll, I'll say with this, even if there's tension in my band at any time, performance, pre performance, absolutely the performance and post performance is sacred time. You don't discuss what went wrong. You don't argue. If someone brings something and, you know, is feels a need to air something, I will divert that. I have a pretty strict rule, you know, no contention on gig day. Well, there's, what if, what if I was coming up. in your band and contentious about there being no contention on gig day, though? I would avoid you at all costs. <laughs> yeah. That sounds like a smart move. <laughs> yeah. 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 I like that rule. So, yeah. But and it, I, and it's better when it's natural too. Right. And, but I mean, well, you, the stage should be your church. The stage should be your sacred place. Totally. Yeah. It's exactly right. Yeah. It's where I want it to be. Like I, I feel safe up there, which is weird because, you know, <laughs> there's few places in the world where you're a bigger target than you are when you're basically standing still on stage, you know. But you, you feel kind of connected to all things in the universe. You're you connected do. that you're making some music. You're part of a team. You're you're doing something of meaning to people that are in front of you. I mean, there, there's a lot of reasons that 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 overwhelming sense of well-being comes upon you when everything's going right on stage. Yep. And and, uh, you know, it's why we do it, man. <laughs> it's why you keep coming back. Yep. It is. It is it's extraordinary. So it, this is interesting because. Um, Johnny D, the the singer for Monkey Fist, as I said, he's started playing guitar more and more lately. And he uh, he has done now one solo gig uh, on his own. He wanted to, you know, see what that was like and and prove that he could do it. And really, it started as him not wanting to have to book Monkey Fist as a duo with another guitar player. It's like, well, what if he wants to bring, say, me to a Monkey Fist gig, you know, and playing Cajon? Like, could he? can handle, handle the guitar. And so he proved it to himself. He could do it. And as we were getting ready, I think it was actually mid gig. Um, the other day he turned to Maddie and I, and he says, you know, I know I can do this by myself. He said, but I, I, I felt lonely on stage. Mm. You know, he said, I really kind of liked that. Uh, I like this, you know, where I've got two other people and we're in this together and it's sort of this magic thing. And that's where Matt said, his whole like all request nights come from. He says, yeah, he says when I'm doing solo stuff, uh, it, you know, it it's me and the crowd. He's like, so like I make them be the ones that are engaging with me so that I've got something all night long. It's like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you've, I'm, I'm, you've experienced that, right. Doing your own solo, solo gigs. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, any <laughs> clearly you're pensive now. So yeah, just letting it wash over me. Uh, yeah. not, nothing to add there, but um, okay. Okay. a good conversation for another time. Like, that that could be a show unto itself. I think it could. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's yeah, it's interesting. It and it's um, I really like that bubble on stage uh, where it's just you know you're in the zone. It's good. It's good. Well, I you know we could go on and on, but I feel like. This, I feel like we're at a good spot to wrap this up today, unless you got something else, man. I'm good for today. All right. All right. Well, then it's time to bring the band in. Make sure the band's always performing. And there they are. And never, never disagreeing on gig day. Never disagree on gig day. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, it always sucks when something comes up that's like, you know, contentious, even if it doesn't have to be. Always be performing. See you next week. Always. Bye.